Hi, it's Zeke with the Eastside Church of Christ in Baytown, Texas, and we're continuing in our study of Paul's early letters. Today we're going to be in the second chapter of 1 Thessalonians. If you've been with us in our study, you remember that last time we looked at the first chapter. It's a scant 10 verses, but there's so much in it. In that chapter, Paul wrote about the glowing reports he had received about this model church, and they were a model church in many ways, and he keeps reaffirming that message. Uh, in fact, there are several times in the in, in chapter 2 uh, where the information that Paul writes kind of amplifies what he's already said in chapter 1. For instance, uh, chapter 2 verses 1 through 6 kind of expands upon chapter 1 verses 4 through 10. Chapter 2 verses 7 through 12 enlarges upon uh, chapter 1 verse 9 and, and possibly verse, verse 5 as well. Uh, chapter 2, verses 13 through 16, echoes what Paul had said in chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, and verse 10. So, Paul reaffirms the message, possibly because he's so glad for the news that he had received, in spite of the fears that he had harbored about the direction that this this church might have have taken. Don't forget that there were agitators that were working among the, the Thessalonians, that were probably impugning uh, and slandering Paul's character and questioning his motives. And Paul addresses some of that in, in, in this book. But he turns now in chapter 2 his attention to reminders of how he and his companions, uh, Silas and probably Timothy among them, had presented the gospel to the Thessalonians and, and how the Thessalonians had received it. But again, in the background, there's these questions that we might have. Were there ill-founded rumors that were swirling around uh, concerning the character and the motivation of these evangelists who had gone to Thessalonica? Or was Paul simply reminding them of the Christ-like character of not only himself, but also his fellow workers? At the very least, Paul wanted to put the... He wanted the Thessalonians to not only trust the integrity with which the message was delivered, but also to know the depth of affection that he and his fellow workers shared for the Thessalonians and their souls. And he wanted them to realize that this was something that was already driven home to them while Paul and his companions were among them. There were several times in in chapters 2 through 5 where he drives home the point of what they know. In verse 1 of chapter 2, he says, You yourselves know, in verse 9, you recall. In verse 10, you are witnesses. In verse 11, just as you know. In chapter 3, as you know. In chapter 4, verse 2, for you know. And then in chapter 5, verse 2, you yourselves know full well. All of this is to remind them that what Paul was writing to them, they had already seen in action when he and his fellow workers were among the Thessalonians on their second evangelistic tour. Well, let's begin reading in chapter 2 as Paul reminds them of how the gospel was delivered to them. In chapter 2, verse 1, Paul begins and says, For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But after we had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid such opposition, or rather amid much opposition. For our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, who examines our hearts. For we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, even though as apostles of Christ we might have asserted our authority. But... We prove to be gentle among you, as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Having so fond an affection for you, we were all well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become very dear to us. For you recall, brethren, our labor and hardship, how working night and day so as not to be a burden to any of you, 
we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and so is God, how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave toward you believers, just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging you and imploring each one of you as a father would his own children so that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. And we'll stop there for now. The first thing that we can notice is concerning how the gospel came to us. Paul mentions in verse 2, it came amid opposition. And that was really the manner of ministry for Paul and, and his fellow workers. They went from adversity to adversity because they were constantly dogged by detractors and those who wanted to not only besmirch their character, but stamp out the movement that had begun. After having been beaten and imprisoned in Philippi, which he mentions in verse 2, they continued right on preaching the gospel, in spite of the fact that the more preaching they did, the more trouble came to them. And uh, we can see in Acts chapter 17, some of the the trouble that had come to them, we talked about it a little bit in, in our first our first lesson in First Thessalonians. But go back for a moment to Acts chapter 17. Verse 5 says, As Paul was in Thessalonica, the Jews became jealous, and they took along some wicked men from the marketplace. They formed a mob and set the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason. Jason was obviously a, a fellow believer, perhaps a new convert in Thessalonica, so talk about what a trial by fire those those uh, early converts were going through but this was what Paul and his companions continually had to endure as they went about preaching the gospel back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 at the end of verse 2 he said we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much opposition that word opposition is a, is, is a strong word. It's from the Greek word agony, which sounds a lot like our English word agony. And that's maybe gives it a, a flavor of, of what all is entailed in this. It, it conveys a struggle, a fight, a great conflict. And that's how the word is sometimes translated in other places in the writings of Paul. In Colossians chapter 2, the same word is used for a great struggle that Paul said he had on behalf of the Colossians. Considering the end of his own life that was coming up, Paul said, I have fought the good fight. In Philippians 1 and verse 30, he speaks about a conflict that the Philippians saw in him. Because there was so much turmoil that swirled around Paul, it was necessary for him to have the boldness that he said he had. There in 1 Thessalonians 2 and in verse 2, in order to preach the gospel. It was delivered to them amid much opposition. Secondly, Paul tells us in verses 3 and 4 that it was delivered in truth. He says, For our exhortation did not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. Paul understands that he has been entrusted with something vitally important. And so he he, he accepted his responsibility to, to that trust, knowing that he and his companions were going to be held accountable for it. So he emphasizes the purity of the message, even while maintaining the purity of of his own motives towards them. Not only was the message pure and free from error, but also he says, our way of delivering it to you was free from any any deceit or impurity. And three times in this section, in verse 2, 8, and 9, he refers to it as the gospel of God. Not only referring to its source, but recognizing that, as Jesus said, God's word is truth. He maintains the purity of the message, the absolute steadfast reliability and integrity of that message. Now in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul wrote concerning some who peddled the gospel for money, thinking that there would be some 
financial gain to be had from it. Here, Paul says, no, that's not us. We had no ulterior motives in how we delivered that to you. Because Paul maintains that it was delivered not only in truth, but in sincerity. Read again verses 5 and 6. He said, For we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, even though as apostles of Christ we might have asserted our authority. There's a word that Paul used back in verse 3, the word deceit. And it carries the idea of, of, of baiting a hook, of, of, of maybe trying to reel someone in, of tricking them into accepting something or believing something. Well, Paul says, that wasn't us. We didn't, we didn't trick you into accepting the gospel. And Paul says in verses 5 and 6 that, that they had no selfish ambitions. Now, when he wrote to the Galatians, he pointed out that, that those Jews who were trying to disrupt their salvation certainly had uh, ulterior motives. And in Galatians chapter 6, in Galatians 6 and in verse 12, he speaks of them. He says, Those who desire to make a good showing in the flesh try to compel you to be circumcised simply so that they will not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For those who are uncircumcised, or rather for those who are circumcised, do not even keep the law themselves, but they desire to have you circumcised so that they may boast in your flesh. All they were doing was trying to chalk up followers, or rather followers, for themselves. And again, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul says, that's not us. That's not how we did things. We don't want division. We don't want strife. We want unity that's based on God. In fact, he wrote about it in the letter to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He said, Now I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I am a Paul, I have Apollos, I have Cephas, and I have Christ. So he asks, Well, has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Paul says, I don't want anyone to call themselves after me. He says, It's not about me. It's not about gaining followers for myself. Paul says they needed to know that their motives were pure so that they could believe that the message was pure. And there's an important lesson there for us. Sometimes we hear the end justifies the means. And we see it in churches all across the country that they can do whatever they want just as long as they can chalk up their numbers. Uh, in the, the, the realm of, of uh, salvation, maybe they use uh, <laughs> a bait to draw people in. They have pizza nights and, and concerts and all kinds of things in which they can, they can entice people to come in. Paul says all we used was the gospel. Sometimes there are those who, who use any means necessary in order to, to further what they believe is, is the work of the church. In fact, there was one elder that I had studied with for a while who said those very words to me, whatever means gets the job done. Well, Paul obviously didn't believe that. Paul made sure that the means were right by God first in order to achieve the right ends, the desired ends. Back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul says that not only was this delivered among amid opposition, but also in truth and sincerity, he says, the gospel was delivered to you with care. Kind of like a mother. That's what he refers to here in verse 7. He says, for we prove to be gentle among you, as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become very dear to us. Paul speaks of investment. Not only investing of the gospel, but also, as he says, of our own lives. They were establishing relationship with the Thessalonians. They wanted them to have relationship not only with God, that was 
that was the end that they were striving for, but also with themselves. Paul wanted them to know just how he had invested himself, as he and his fellow workers had, with the Thessalonians. And this may be an indication to us that Paul spent quite a bit more time with them than the short passage that we read about in Acts 17 shows. You recall in the first couple of verses of Acts chapter 17, it tells us that Paul spent three Sabbaths reasoning with the Jews. Well, I'm sure he spent a lot more than just three weeks with them because the teaching that he had imparted to them indicates that he had spent some time there. And Not only that, but the very fact that they had established relationships with one another proves it. He says here in verse 8, you had become very dear to us. And according to this illustration that Paul gives in verse 7 concerning a mother, he says that he and his companions tenderly cared for them as a mother does for her children. In the phrase tenderly cared, there is a, there is a, a, a word that's used in another place. It's used in Ephesians 5.29 and it's translated cherishes. Paul says regarding a husband, no one has ever hated his own flesh but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. So Paul says that a husband tenderly cares for his wife, just as Christ tenderly cares for the church. Now, all of this tender caring takes time and effort and a willingness to to invest personally with people, with one another. And I wonder, do we, do we do that? Far too often, people tend to hold each other kind of at arm's length. We don't want them to invade too much into our lives, and we don't want to give up too much information of ourselves, because simply it makes us vulnerable. Well, there is vulnerability in relationship, but there is also great reward. What you give, you get back, and what you get back, you give again. The thing about relationship is that we have something in Christ that ties us together. It is our fellowship with Him. In fact, it's the reason why we have fellowship with one another. It is this relationship that Paul wanted them to realize so much that was so important to them. It's certainly something that we should realize is important to us as as well. Well, continuing his case that the gospel was delivered to them with so many positive factors. He continues with the idea that it was delivered to them with integrity, such as a father might have. In verses 9 through 12, he says, For you recall, brethren, our labor and hardship, how working night and day so as not to be a burden to any of you, we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and so is God, how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave toward you believers, just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father would his own children, so that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Paul and Silas, and certainly Timothy's, desire was to be a help to them and not a burden. And it's shown by their willingness to work. And also, I think, implies their own transparency of of character or motor, not motor, but motive and, 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 and intention to the Thessalonians. On this same trip, back in Acts chapter 18, we see that when Paul was in Corinth, He worked with his hands. He was a tent maker. And so we knew how to work with leather and whatever goods were available to to make durable tents. And he wasn't above working with his hands in order to do that. Now, we might consider that an average workday back then was about 12 hours. They worked from sunup to sundown. And here Paul says, we work day and night, not just with our hands, but also working to bring you the gospel. You think about how much time that must have entailed. And how important it was for them to see that Paul is not in this for the money. He's not in here to try to fleece us as those who peddled the gospel that he spoke about in in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 17. Paul is all about making sure that we recognize his righteous motivation towards us, his integrity of character, 
And it's shown by the fact that he says, just as a father, he says, we try to impart to, impart to you lessons that are, that are most important to you. We're going to see later on where Paul is going to scold the Thessalonians, some of them, for not learning that important lesson of integrity of action. In fact, if you'll go with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, in verse 6, Paul says, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll stop there for a moment. Just consider that there is no higher authority anybody can, can, can uh, appeal to someone. There is no way you can drive home someone's obligation that is higher than to appeal to them based on their obligation to God, to the Lord. He says, We command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life and not according to the tradition which you receive from us. I think what we were reading about in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verses 9 through 12, the tradition that Paul had delivered was one of busyness, one of integrity of work. Because he goes on to say in verse 7 of 2 Thessalonians 3, For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example, because we did not act in an undisciplined manner among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with labor and hardship, we kept working night and day so that you would not be a burden to any of you. Not because we do not have the right to do this, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you so that you would follow our example. For even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. Paul condemns those who were lazy moochers. And he says, that's not the example that we left among you. Back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, in verses 9 through 12, Paul says, Our desire is that you learn the lessons from us. In verse 12, so that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Just as a father wants his children to learn sufficiency and a good work ethic, Paul taught that they should be willing to put effort into the things that are most important, whether they're, they're vocational or spiritual. So let me just ask you a question. Considering all the things that we have seen so far, concerning how the gospel was delivered, considering all of this. What does it mean when Paul says to walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you? I think at the very least, it means that someone's going to have to realize that following Jesus isn't easy. But there is a right way, and we can know that right way. And if we want to help others walk in that right way, they're going to have to see the not only the, the, the purity of the message, but also the integrity of our motives toward them, even while we ourselves grow. I think Paul put it really well in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians 4, in verse 14, begin there with me. In Ephesians 4 and in verse 14, Paul says, As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. And then Paul goes on to say that we don't do this in a vacuum. We work it out with others. We give what we can to others as they give what they can to us as well. And Paul says, in all of this, there is growth. And isn't that really what a father wants to see in his children? He wants to see them grow up. I think that's part of, at least, what Paul means when he talks about walking in a manner worthy of the God who calls you, that we're doing our very best to grow, to foster relationship, not only with God more deeply, but certainly with others as well. Paul continues. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, with not only how the gospel was delivered, but how the gospel was received. Let's read verses 13 through 16. Paul says, For this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you accepted it 
not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you also endured the same sufferings at the hands of your own countrymen, even as they did from the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. They're not pleasing to God, but hostile to all men, hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved, with the result that they will always that they always fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them to the utmost. Let's stop and consider some of the things that drive home the good way in which the Thessalonians received the gospel. Paul reminded them of how the impartation of truth along with the integrity of the messengers combined for an impressive response from the Thessalonians. For instance, they appreciated the word because he says you received it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, not according to the fickle, unreliable nature of of revelations from men, but as the word of God, that which is true and powerful. And of course, Paul refers to the power of the gospel in Romans 1 verse 16 when he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation. Paul saw that power of God work. And he saw it work in the conviction of those who appreciated it for what it was and then appropriated it for themselves by accepting its authority over them and its purpose for them. They appropriated it. They took the word. Again, look at what Paul says in verse in verse 13. You received the word of God. They took it for themselves. They recognized its source as well as its importance. And because of that, they recognized their obligation to apply the word, and that they did. He says in verse 14, You brethren became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. The first churches of the Lord that were established in Judea. He says, You saw how they worked and and now you began to see the importance of that work in yourselves and to emulate that. Remember before in chapter 1 we talked about how they had imitated Paul and his companions and now other churches were imitating them. But Paul says, You're not done following good examples. You recognize the importance of the word, and so they obeyed and they they continued to allow allow it to mold and motivate them, even as they observed that same work in others. So let's consider this for a moment before we, we move on to the end of our lesson today. Let me just ask you this. How does the word of God perform its work in you who believe? That's what he says at the end of verse 13. It's not the word of men, It's the Word of God which performs its work in you who believe. Maybe there are a couple of ways that we could look at that. One is the inside work that the Word of God does, the conviction. You know, in Hebrews chapter 4 and in verse 12, in fact, let's just turn there together. In Hebrews 4 and in verse 12, the Hebrew writer talks about the power of God's Word as it works in us. He says, The Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from His sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. Now we may be able to hide our thoughts and intentions and our motives from others around us, but we can't hide it from God. And God wrote about it. God imparted that to us in His Word. So when we read the Word of God, we see its penetrating ability to go right to, as it were, the heart of the matter. Who we are. Who we really are. Who we are when no one sees. What we aspire to. It tells us all about ourselves. The inside work of God's Word is to convict us of sin and our need to get right with Him. But there's also an outside work 
that God's Word does. As we obey it, there's the outward change in our lives. The obvious manifestation that the Word of God is powerful and it drives and motivates every decision and every choice that we make. I think at least that's part of what Paul might have implied when he talks about the Word of God that performs its work in those who believe. Because if you believe it, really believe it, you're going to do something with it. Paul talked about those Jews who he says in verse 15, not only killed Jesus, the prophets, but also drove Paul and his fellow, his fellow workers out of different cities. He says they're not pleasing to God, but they're hostile to all men. It's not just it's not just against God that they're fighting. They're really fighting against all men because the message that Paul and his companions had been entrusted with was one that was of ultimate good to everyone. So he says by fighting against God's purpose, they're really fighting against men. And he says with the result in verse 16 that they always fill up the measure of their sins. You know, that was an age-old thing with with the Jews. They were always finding themselves on, on the wrong side. They were always fighting against God. And it tore Paul up. In Romans chapters 10 and 11, he talks about how much he wanted to see his fellow Jews saved. As he saw the, the great acceptance of the gospel by a variety of other peoples, by Gentiles, really he wanted to see his own people receive it. Now, while many did, far many more didn't. And his grief over their blindness is told to us in, in Romans 10 and, and 11 and reminds us maybe of Jesus' own words in Luke 10 and verse 16. In Luke 10 verse 16, Jesus says that those who listen to his disciples listens to me. But then he says, those who reject you also reject me, and those who reject me rejects the one who sent me. In the end, when we reject the gospel, we reject God himself. Well, may God help us that that will not be true for any of us. There is an impact verse that I think is really important. It's verse 13. We've looked at it some already. Paul says, For this reason we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. I want you to do something. I want you to think about how when you first came to faith in Christ, when the word of God had worked and penetrated through your heart, and shown you your deep need for forgiveness. What was that like for you? Maybe that's the kind of motivation, the joy of salvation, that maybe some need to have again. How wonderful it is to see what a friend of mine termed light bulb moments. When you're, you're studying with someone, and they finally see it, they get that light, mo- that light bulb moment, and you can almost see the light above their head go on and they realize that, wow, this, this is talking to me. This is what I need to do. And then those wonderful words, I need to be baptized. Folks who are willing to apply the word to their own lives. That's the power of God that performs work in those who believe. I thank you so much for joining us today. And I hope that you'll join us again as we continue to study Paul's early letters Next week, we'll be looking at the rest of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and on into chapter 3. Hope that you'll join us. God bless you.